Chess by Stefan Zweig, Second Part But the most terrible part of these interrogations, for me, was that I could never guess or work out how much the Gestapo really knew about what went on in my legal office and what they wanted to worm out of me. As I've told you, I had sent the really incriminating papers to my uncle at the last minute by way of my housekeeper. But had he received them? Had he failed to receive them? And how much had that clerk given away? How many letters had been intercepted? How many might they have extracted by now from some naive cleric in the German monasteries that we represented? And they asked questions and yet more questions. What securities had I bought for such and such a monastery? Which banks did I correspond with? Did I or did I not know a hair so and so? Had I received letters from Switzerland and Stine Kassil? And as I could never guess how much they had found out already, every answer became the heaviest of responsibilities. If I let slip something they hadn't known, I might be unnecessarily delivering someone up to the knife. If I denied too much, I was doing myself no good. But the interrogation wasn't the worst of it. The worst was coming back to my void after the questioning, back to the same room with the same table, the same bed, the same wash basin, the same wallpaper. For as soon as I was alone with myself I tried reconstructing what I ought to have said in reply and what I must say next time to divert any suspicion that some unconsidered remark of mine might have aroused. I thought it all over. I went back over everything, examined my own statements, checked every word of what I had said to the chief interrogator. I recapitulated every question they had asked, every answer I had given. I tried to think what they might have put down in the written record, but I realized I could never work it out. I would never know. However, once these thoughts had started up in the vacuum, they wouldn't stop going round and round in my head, again and again, in ever-changing combinations, and they went on until I fell asleep. After every interrogation by the Gestapo, my own thoughts took over the torment of questioning, probing and torturing me just as mercilessly, perhaps even more cruelly, for every interrogation ended after an hour. And thanks to the insidious torture of solitary confinement those thoughts never stopped. And around me, always, I had only the table, the cupboard, the bed, the wallpaper, the window, no means of diversion, no book, no newspaper, no new face, no pencil for making notes, no match to play with, nothing, nothing, nothing. Only now did I realize how diabolically ingenious the hotel room method was how fiendishly well devised in psychological terms. In a concentration camp you might have had to cart stones until your hands bled and your frostbitten feet fell off in your shoes. You would have slept packed together with two dozen other people in the stench and the cold. But you would have seen faces. You could have stared at a field, a cart, a tree, a star, something, anything, while here you were always surrounded by the same things, always the same always the terrible same. There was nothing here to distract me from my thoughts, my delusions, my morbid recapitulations. And that was exactly what they intended. I was to wretch and wretch on my own thoughts until they choked me. And in the end I had no choice but to spew them out. No choice but to tell them everything, all they were after. Handing over the information and the human beings they wanted at last. I gradually felt my nerves begin to give way under the pressure of the void, and aware of the danger I stretched them to breaking point to find or invent something to divert my mind. To keep myself occupied I tried remembering and reciting anything I had ever learned by heart, the national anthem and the playground rhymes of my childhood, the homer I had studied at school paragraphs of the civil code. Then I tried arithmetic adding and dividing numbers at random, but my memory was unable to hold the numbers steady in the void. I couldn't concentrate on anything. The same thought kept flickering through my mind. What do they know? What did I say yesterday? What must I say next time? This truly unspeakable state of affairs lasted for months. For months it's easy to write down, just under a dozen characters. It's easy to say, for months to syllables. Your lips can articulate such a sound in a quarter of a second, for months, but no one can describe, assess, demonstrate to himself or anyone else how long a given period lasts in a timeless, 
spaceless void, and you can't explain to anyone how it gnaws away at you and destroys you. Nothing, nothing, nothing around you. Only the same table and bad and wash basin and wallpaper, and always that silence, always the same jailer handing in food without looking at you, always the same thoughts circling around the same object in the void until you go mad. With alarm, I realized that my brain was becoming confused. At first I had been inwardly clear during the interrogations. I had answered calmly and carefully, my ability to think what to say and what not to say at the same time was still in working order. Now I stammered in articulating even the simplest sentences, for as I spoke I was staring, hypnotized, at the pen recording my statements on paper, as if I were trying to follow my own words. I felt my strength failing me. I felt the moment coming closer and closer when I would tell them everything to save myself tell them what I knew and perhaps even more. When I would give away a dozen human beings and their secrets to escape that choking void, without gaining any more than a brief respite for myself. One evening I really did reach that point when the jailer happened to bring my food at that moment of suffocation. I suddenly shouted, take me to be questioned. I want to tell them everything. I want to make a statement. I'll tell them where the securities are, where the money is. I'll tell them everything, everything. Fortunately, he didn't hear me. Perhaps he didn't want to hear me. In my hour of greatest need, something quite unexpected happened, offering me a way of escape, at least for a time. It was the end of July, a dark, overcast, rainy day. I remember that last detail clearly because the rain was drumming against the window panes in the corridor down which I was led to be questioned. I had to wait in the chief interrogator's anteroom. You always had to wait before every interrogation. Leaving you to wait was part of the technique too. First they made you nervous with the summons, with being suddenly fetched from your cell in the middle of the night. And then, once you had adjusted to the idea of interrogation, once you had prepared your mind and will to resist, they kept you waiting. A deliberately pointless wait of an hour, two hours, three hours before the interrogation itself, to tire your body and weigh your mind down, and I was kept waiting for a particularly long time that Wednesday, the 27th of July, I waited standing in the end room for two full hours. I remember the date so precisely for a particular reason, because in the end room where I had to wait of course I wasn't allowed to sit down in the end room where I had to wait on my feet for two hours there was a calendar. And I can't tell you how. In my hunger for the printed word, for something written, I stared and stared at that one number, those few words on the wall, July 27th. My brain devoured them, so to speak. And then I went on waiting, waiting, staring at the door, wondering when it would finally open, trying to think what my inquisitors might ask this time, and knowing it would be nothing like what I was preparing for. In spite of all this, however, the torment of waiting and standing was a pleasure too, and did me good, because at least this room wasn't the same as mine. It was a little larger, had two windows instead of one, and it was without the bed, and without the wash basin, and without the crack on the window sill that I had studied a million times. The door was painted a different color, there was a different armchair by the wall, and on the left a filing cabinet with files and a coat stand with hangers on which were draped three or four wet army overcoats, the coats of my torturers. So I had something new and different to look at, something different at last for my starved eyes, which clutched greedily at every detail. I observed every fold of those coats. I noticed, for instance, a drop of water dangling from one of the wet collars, and absurd as it may sound, I waited with ridiculous excitement to see if that drop would finally run down the fold of the fabric, or if it would continue to defy gravity and stay there longer. In fact, I stared and stared at the drop for minutes on end as if my life depended on it. Then, when at last it had rolled down, I counted the buttons on the coats, eight on one coat, eight on another, Ten on the third, then I compared the lapels, my hungry eyes touched, played with, seized upon all those silly little details with an avidity I can hardly describe. And suddenly my gaze fixed on something. 
I had seen that the side pocket of one of the coats was bulging slightly. I went closer and thought that the rectangular shape of the bulge told me what was inside the pocket, a book. I hadn't had a book in my hands for, for months, and the mere idea of a book where I could see words printed one after another, lines, pages, leaves, a book in which I could pursue new, different, fresh thoughts to divert me, could take them into my brain, had something both intoxicating and stupefying about it. Hypnotized, my eyes stared at the small bulge made by that book inside the pocket. They gazed fearily at that one inconspicuous spot as if to burn a hole in the coat. At last I could no longer contain my greed. Instinctively I moved closer. The mere prospect of being able at least to feel the book through the fabric made the nerves in my hands glow to the fingertips. Almost without knowing it, I moved closer and closer. Fortunately, the jailer didn't notice what must have been my strange behavior, or perhaps he thought it only natural that a man who had been standing upright for two hours would want to lean against the wall a little. Finally, I was very close to the coat, and I had intentionally put my hands behind my back so that they could touch it and noticed. I felt the fabric, and there really was something rectangular on the other side something flexible and rustling slightly a book a book and a thought flashed through me quick as lightning steal the book you might succeed and you can hide it in your cell and then read 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 again at last no sooner had the thought entered my mind than it worked like strong poison suddenly there was a roaring in my ears and my heart began to hammer my hands turned cold as ice and wouldn't obey me but after the first stupefaction I moved quietly and warily even closer to the coat, keeping my eyes on my jailer all the time, and with my hands hidden behind my back I moved the book further and further up in the pocket from the outside. And then, one snatch, one slight, careful tug, and suddenly I had the small, not very thick book in my hand. Only now did I take fright at what I had done, but there was no going back at this point. Yet where was I to put it? Behind my back, I pushed the book down under my trousers where the belt held them up, and from there gradually round to my hip, so that as I walked I could hold it in place with my hand down beside the seam of my trousers in a military stance. Now for the first task. I moved away from the coat stand, one step, two steps, three steps. It worked. It was possible to hold the book in place as I walked if I kept my hand firmly pressed to my belt. Then came the interrogation. It required a greater effort from me than ever, for as I answered questions I was really concentrating all my strength not on what I was saying but on holding the book in place and noticed. Fortunately the interrogation was a short one this time, and I got the book back to my room safe and sound I won't bore you with all the details. Once. When I was halfway down the corridor, it slipped dangerously low, and I had to simulate a bad coughing fit so that I could band over and push it back up under my belt again. But what a moment it was when I came back to my hell, alone at last, yet not alone any longer. Yell yeah, probably expect me to have taken the book out at once, to have looked at it, read it, by no means. First I wanted to enjoy actually having a book in my possession artificially drawing out the delightfully intriguing pleasure of anticipation, dreaming what kind of book the one I had stolen might ideally be. First of all, very closely printed, with many, many printed characters in it, many, many thin pages, so that it would take me longer to read it. Then I hoped it would be a work to exercise my mind, nothing shallow or light, but a book that would teach me something, a book I could learn by heart, poetry and preferably what a bold dream, Goethe or Homer. But finally, I could no longer contain my avid curiosity, lying on the bed, so that if my jailer suddenly opened the door he couldn't see what I was doing, I took the book out from under my belt with shaking hands. The first glance was a disappointment, and even made me feel a kind of bitter anger. The book I had carried off at such great peril and was looking forward to with such ardent expectation was nothing but a chess manual, a collection of a hundred and fifty championship matches. If I hadn't been locked and barred in it have flung the book through an open window in my first rage, for what use was this nonsense to me? What could I do with it? As a schoolboy, like most others, 
I had set at a chessboard now and then out of boredom. But what good was this theoretical stuff going to be? You can't play chess without a partner, and certainly not without chessmen and a chessboard. Morrisly, I leafed through the pages, hoping I might yet find something there to read. A foreword, an introduction, but I found only the bare, square patterns of the boards for the various games, and under them symbols of which I could make nothing at first. A 2 or 3, an FL3, and so on. It all seemed to me a kind of algebra to which I had no key. Only gradually did I work out that the letters A, B and C were for the horizontal rows of squares, the ranks, and the numbers 1 to 8 for the vertical rows, the files, and they indicated the present position of each separate chessman. That at least gave a language to the purely graphic patterns. Perhaps, I thought, I could make myself a kind of chessboard in my cell and then try to play these games. Like a sign from heaven, it struck me that my bedspread so happened to have a design of large checks. Properly folded, it could finally be arranged to show sixty for squares. So I first hid the book under my mattress, tearing out only the first page. Then I began modeling the chessmen, king, queen and so on, out of small crumbs saved from my bread, in what was of course a ridiculously imperfect way. After endless effort I was finally able to reconstruct the positions shown in the chess book on my checkered bedspread. But when I tried to play the whole game through I failed entirely at first with my ludicrous breadcrumb chessmen, half of which I had colored darker with dust. I kept getting confused during those first few days. Five, ten, twenty times I had to begin that single game again from the beginning. But who in the world had as much useless spare time as I did, the slave of the void, and who had such an immense desire to learn and so much patience available? After six days I was already playing the game flawlessly to its end. After eight more days I didn't even need the crumbs on the bedspread to picture the positions in the chess book. And after another eight days I could do without the chack bedspread too. Automatically, what had at first been the abstract symbols in the book of 1, a 2, C7, C8 changed inside my head into visual, three-dimensional positions. The switch was a complete success. I had projected the chessboard and chessmen into my mind, where I could now survey the positions of the pieces on the board by means of the formulae alone. Just as a mere glance at a score is enough for a trained musician to hear all the separate parts of a piece and the way they sound together. After another 14 days I was easily able to play any game in the book from memory or blindfold. As the technical expression has it and only now did I begin to understand what immeasurable relief my bold theft had brought me. For all at once I had an occupation a pointless, aimless one if you like but an occupation that annihilated the void around me. In those 150 tournament matches, I had a wonderful weapon against the oppressive monotony of my own space and time. To keep the delight of my new occupation going, I divided every day up exactly, to games in the morning, to games in the afternoon, and then a quick recapitulation in the evening. That filled my day, which used to be as formless as jelly. I was occupied without exhausting myself, for the wonderful advantage of the game of chess is that, by concentrating your intellectual energies into a strictly limited area, it doesn't tire the brain even with the most strenuous thinking, but instead increases its agility and vigor. Gradually, in what at first had been purely mechanical repetitions of the championship matches, an artistic, pleasurable understanding began to awaken in me. I learned to understand the subtleties of the game, the tricks and ruses of attack and defense. I grasped the technique of thinking ahead, combination, counterattack, and soon I could recognize the personal style of every grandmaster as infallibly from his own way of playing a game as you can identify a poet's verses from only a few lines. What began as mere occupation to fill the time became enjoyment and the figures of the great strategists of chess such as Alekhine, Lasker, Bogolyubov and Tartakawa entered my solitary confinement as beloved comrades. Endless variety enlivened my silent cell every day, and the very regularity of my mental exercises restored to my mind its endangered security. 
I felt my brain refreshed and newly polished, so to speak, by the constant discipline of thought. It was particularly evident that I was thinking more clearly and concisely in the interrogations. I had unconsciously perfected my defense against false threats and concealed tricks at the chessboard. I no longer exposed my weaknesses under questioning now, and I even felt that the Gestapo men were beginning to regard me with a certain respect. Perhaps, since they saw everyone else collapse, they were silently wondering from what secret sources I alone drew the strength for such steadfast resistance. This happy time, when I was systematically replaying the hundred and fifty games in the book day after day, lasted for about two and a half to three months. Then I unexpectedly came up against a dead end. Suddenly I was facing the void again. For as soon as I had played each individual game from beginning to end twenty or thirty times, it lost the charm of novelty and surprise, its old power to excite and stimulate me was gone. What was the point in replaying games again and again when I knew them all by heart, move after move? As soon as I had played the first opening, the rest of the game jogged automatically along in my mind, there was no surprise any more, no tension, no problems. To keep myself occupied and create the sense of effort and diversion that were now essential to me, I really needed another book with other games in it. But as it was impossible for me to get one, there was only one way my mind could take in its strange, crazed course. I must invent new games instead of playing the old ones. I must try to play with myself, or rather against myself. I don't know how far you've ever thought about the intellectual situation in this king of games, but even the briefest reflection should be enough to show that as chess is a game of pure thought involving no element of chance, it's a logical absurdity to try playing against yourself. At heart the attraction of chess resides entirely in the development of strategies into different brains, in the fact that black doesn't know what maneuvers white will perform in this war of the mind and keeps trying to guess them and thwart them, while White himself is trying to anticipate and counter Black's secret intentions. If Black and White were one and the same person, Yao'd have the ridiculous state of affairs where one and the same brain simultaneously knows and doesn't know something, and when operating as White can forget entirely what it wanted and intended a minute ago when it was Black. Such dual thinking really presupposes a complete split of consciousness, an arbitrary ability to switch the function of the brain on and off again as if it were a mechanical apparatus. Wanting to play chess against yourself is a paradox, like jumping over your own shadow. Well, to be brief, in my desperation I spent months trying to achieve this absurd impossibility. However, I had no option but to pursue it. If I were not to fall victim to pure madness or see my mind waste away entirely, my dreadful situation forced me at least to try splitting myself into a black self and a white self to keep from being crushed by the terrible void around me. Drive B leaned back in his dak care and closed his eyes for a minute. It was as if he were trying to suppress a disturbing memory by force. Once again the strange little tick that he couldn't control appeared this time at the left-hand corner of his mouth. Then he set up a little straighter in his dak care. Well up to this point I hope I've explained it all reasonably intelligibly to you, but I'm afraid I'm not at all sure that I can give you as clear an idea of what happened next. For this new occupation put such extraordinary pressure on the brain that it made any kind of self-control at the same time impossible. I've already told you that in my opinion playing chess against yourself is essentially absurd. But even that absurdity might stand a minimal chance with a real chess board in front of you. Since the reality of the board does allow you to distance yourself to some extent, occupy a different material territory. In front of a real chess board with real chessmen, you can insert pauses for thought change from one side of the table to the other in purely physical terms, seeing the situation now through Black's eyes and now through the eyes of White, but forced as I was to project these battles against myself or with myself. If you like into imaginary space, I had to keep the situation on all 64 squares clearly in my mind, and in addition calculate not just the present state of the game but the possible subsequent moves of both partners. 
While also, and I know how ludicrous, all this sounds imagining four or five moves in advance for each of myself, working them out twice or three times, no, six, eight, twelve times, in this game in the abstract space of the mind I was obliged forgive me for my presumption in asking you to think along these deranged lines to work out four or five moves ahead as player white, and the same as player black combining in advance all the situations that might arise as the game developed, and I had to do it, so to speak, with two brains, white's brain and black's brain. But even this splitting of myself wasn't the most dangerous part of my abstruse experiment, that was the fact that in devising the games independently I suddenly lost the ground under my feet and fell into an abyss. Just playing through the tournament matches, as I had in the earlier weeks, after all, was nothing but reproduction, purely the reenactment of material provided to me, and as such it was no more of a strain than learning poems by heart or memorizing legal paragraphs. It was a limited, disciplined activity, an excellent mental exercise. Mighty games played in the morning and to games in the afternoon were a quota that I could achieve without becoming excited. They acted as a substitute for a normal occupation, and anyway, if I went wrong in the course of a game or wasn't sure what to do next, I could always resort to the book. That was the only reason why this activity had been such a healthy, rather soothing one for my shattered nerves. Because playing out games between other people didn't involve me personally, it made no difference to me whether black or white won, since it was really Elekhine or Begolubov trying to win the championship and I myself, my mind and soul enjoyed the games only as a spectator, appreciating their changes of fortune and felicitous aspects. But as soon as I tried playing against myself I began unconsciously issuing myself with the challenge. Each of my two selves, my black self and my white self, had to compete with the other, and each separately felt an impatient ambition to triumph, to win. As my black self I felt feverish anxiety after every move to see what my white self would do next. Each of my two selves felt triumphant when the other made a mistake, and at the same time was angry with itself for its own carelessness. All this seems pointless, and in fact such an artificial schizophrenia, such a split of the consciousness, with its admixture of dangerous excitement, would be unthinkable in a normal human being in normal circumstances. But don't forget that I had been forcibly torn from all normality. I was a captive, innocent but imprisoned. I had been subtly tormented with solitary confinement for months. I was a man who had long wished to vent his pent-up fury on something. And as I had nothing but this pointless game against myself, my fury and desire for revenge were injected, with fanatical enthusiasm, into the game itself. Something in me wanted to be proved right, and I had only that other self within me to oppose, so during the game I worked myself up into almost manic agitation. At first I had thought calmly, soberly. I had paused between one game and the next so that I could recover from the strain, but gradually my inflamed nerves wouldn't let me wait. As soon as my white self had made a move, my black self was feverishly advancing. As soon as a game was over I was challenging myself to the next, because each time one of my chas selves was defeated by the other it wanted its revenge. I shall never be able to say even approximately how many games I played against myself during those last months in my cell. As a result of this insatiable derangement perhaps a thousand, perhaps more. It was an obsession against which I had no defense. From morning to night I thought of nothing but bishops and pawns, rooks and kings, a and b and c, checkmate and castling. All my being and feeling drove me to the checkered square. My delight in playing turned to a lust for playing, my lust for playing into a compulsion to play, a mania, a frenetic fury that filled not only my waking hours but also came to invade my sleep. I could think of nothing but chas. I thought only in chas moves and chas problems. Sometimes I woke with my forehead perspiring and realized that I must still have been unconsciously playing even as I slept. And when I dreamed of people I did so exclusively in terms of the movements of the bishop, the rook, the knight's leaps forward and back, 
Even when I was summoned for interrogation, I couldn't think concisely about my responsibility anymore. I have an idea that during the last interrogations I must have expressed myself with some confusion, because now and then my inquisitors looked at me strangely, but all the time they asked questions and consulted each other. I was just waiting, in my disastrous passion, to be taken back to my cell to go on with my playing, my mad playing of another game and then another and another. Every interruption disturbed me. Even the quarter of an hour when the jailer was cleaning my prison cell, even the two minutes when he brought me food tormented my feverish impatience. Sometimes the bowl containing my meal still stood there untouched in the evening. I had forgotten to eat as I played chess. My only physical feeling was a terrible thirst. It must have been the fever of my constant thinking and playing. I emptied my bottle of water into drafts and plagued the jailer for more. Yet next moment my tongue felt dry in my mouth again. At last my excitement as I played and I did nothing else from morning to night rose to such a degree that I couldn't sit still for a moment. I kept pacing up and down as I thought about the games. Faster and faster and faster I paced. Becoming more and more heated the closer the end of the game came, my desire to win, to triumph, to defeat myself gradually became a kind of rage, and I was trembling with impatience, for one of my chess selves was always too slow for the other. One urged the other on, ridiculous as it may seem to you, when one of my selves didn't counter the other self's move quickly enough I began telling myself angrily, faster, faster, or go on, go on. Of course I now realize that this condition of mine was a pathological form of intellectual overstimulation, for which I can find no name but one hitherto unknown to medicine, chest poisoning. Finally this monomaniac obsession began to attack not just my brain but my body too. I lost weight, my sleep was restless and broken, when I woke up it always cost me a great effort to force my leaden eyelids open, sometimes I felt so weak that when I picked up a glass to drink I had difficulty lifting it to my lips because my hands shook so much, but as soon as the game began a wild strength came over me, I walked up and down with my fists clenched, and sometimes, as if through a red mist, I heard my own voice crying hoarsely and venomously, Jack, or mate, to itself. I myself can't tell you how this terrible, unspeakable condition came to a crisis. All I know is that I woke up one morning, and it was a different waking from usual. My body felt as if it was separate from me. I was resting softly and comfortably. A heavy, beneficial weariness such as I hadn't known for months weighed on my lids so warm and kindly that at first I couldn't bring myself to open my eyes. I lay awake for a few minutes enjoying this heavy apathy, lying there lethargically with my senses pleasantly dulled. Suddenly I thought I heard voices behind me, live human voices speaking words, and you can't imagine my delight, because for months, for almost a year, I had heard no words but the harsh, sharp, malicious remarks made by my bench of interrogators. You're dreaming, I told myself, you're dreaming. Don't open your eyes whatever you do. Let the dream go on, or you'll see your accursed cell around you again. The chair and the wash stand and the table and the wallpaper with its pattern forever the same. You're dreaming go on with the dream. But curiosity got the upper hand. Slowly and cautiously, I opened my eyelids. And wonder of wonders, I was in another room a larger, more spacious room than my hotel cell. An unbarred window let daylight in, and there was a view of trees, green trees swaying in the wind instead of my rigid firewall. The walls here gleamed smooth and white. The ceiling was white and rose high above me, it was true. I was lying in another bed, one I didn't know, and human voices were whispering quietly behind me. It really wasn't a dream. I must instinctively have given a violent start of surprise, because I heard steps approaching. A woman came up to me, moving gracefully, a woman with a white cap on her hair, a nurse. A shiver of delight ran through me, it was a year since I had set eyes on a woman. I stared at this lovely apparition, and there must have been a wild, ecstatic expression in my eyes, for as she came closer the woman said soothingly but firmly, calm, keep calm. But I merely listened to her voice, wasn't that a human being speaking? 
and in addition an unimaginable miracle speaking in a soft, warm, almost tender woman's voice. I stared avidly at her mouth, for in that year of hell I had come to think it improbable that one human being could speak kindly to another. She smiled at me, yes, she smiled, so there were still people capable of a kind smile then put an admonishing finger to her lips and walked quietly on. But I couldn't obey her. I hadn't seen enough of the miracle yet. I tried to force myself upright in the bed to watch her go, to look at the miracle of a kindly human being as she walked away. As I tried to haul myself up by the edge of the bed, however, I found I couldn't do it. Where my right hand usually was, and my fingers and wrist, I felt something strange instead. A large, thick, white wad of fabric, obviously an extensive bandage. At first I stared uncomprehendingly at this white, thick, strange thing on my hand, and then I slowly began to grasp where I was, and wondered what had happened to me. I must have been injured, or else it hurt my own hand. I was in a hospital. At midday the doctor came, a friendly, elderly man. He knew my family name, and mentioned my uncle the imperial physician so respectfully that I immediately felt he was well disposed to me. As we talked, he asked me all kinds of questions, particularly one that surprised me was I a mathematician or a chemist. I said no. Strange, he murmured. In your delirium you kept crying out such strange formulae C3, C4. We could none of us make anything of them. I asked what had happened to me. He gave a rather odd smile. Nothing serious. An acute irritation of the nerves. And he added quietly, after looking cautiously around. Not surprising, after all. You've been here since March the 13th, haven't you? I nodded. No wonder, then, with their methods, he murmured. You're not the first, but don't worry. From the way in which he soothingly whispered this, and thanks to his kind expression, I knew I was in good hands here. Two days later, the kindly doctor told me frankly what had happened. The jailer had heard me shouting out loud in my cell, and at first thought someone had come in and I was quarreling with him. But no sooner did he appear in the doorway than I had rushed at him, uttering wild cries which sounded like, Will you make your move? You rascal, you coward. I had tried to seize him by the throat, and finally I hit out so frantically that he had to call for help. As I was being dragged off in my rabid state, I had suddenly torn myself free, rushed to the window in the corridor, and smashed the pane, cutting my hand you can still see the deep scar here. I had spent my first few nights in hospital in a kind of brain fever, but the doctor thought my senses were perfectly clear now. To be sure, he added quietly, I won't say that to those gentlemen, or they'll have you back in there. Trust me, and I'll do my best. I have no idea what that helpful doctor told my tormentors, but at least he got what he hoped to achieve, my release. He may have said I wasn't responsible for my own actions, or perhaps by now I was of no importance to the Gestapo, for Hitler had occupied Bohemia, so as far as he was concerned that was Austria dealt with. I had only to sign an undertaking to leave our native land forever within two weeks. And those two weeks were so full of the thousands of formalities that former cosmopolitans need in order to travel these days military papers, police papers, tech certificates, a passport, a visa, a health certificate that I had no time to think about the past much. It seems that mysterious powers work to regulate our brains automatically switching off what might burden and endanger the mind. For whenever I tried to think back to my time in that cell the light in my head went out, so to speak, only many weeks later. In fact only here on this ship have I found the courage to remember what happened to me again. And now y'all understand why I acted to your friends in such an unseemly and probably bewildering manner. I was walking through the smoking room entirely by chance when I saw them sitting at the chessboard, and I was instinctively rooted to the spot by surprise and horror, for I had entirely forgotten that chess can be played with a real chessboard and real chessmen. I had forgotten that two completely different people sit opposite each other in person during the game. It actually took me a few minutes to realize that the players were basically involved in the same game that... In my desperate situation, I had tried playing against myself for months. 
The numbers I had used to help me in my grim mental exercises had been only a substitute for those carved chessmen. A symbol of them, my surprise when I saw that the movement of the chessmen on the board was the same as the imaginary moves I had made in my mind was. Perhaps, like the surprise of an astronomer who has used complicated methods to calculate the existence of a new planet on paper and then actually sees it as a white, bright, heavenly body in the sky. As if magnetically drawn to the board, I stared at it and saw my patterns knight, rook, king, queen and pawns as real figures carved from wood. To get an idea of the state of the game, I first had to change them automatically back from my abstract world of figures into moving chessmen. Gradually, I was overcome by curiosity to see a real game between two players. Then came the embarrassing moment when, forgetting common courtesy, I intervened in your game. But your friend's wrong move was like a pang going through my heart. It was purely instinctive when I restrained him, something done impulsively just as Yao'd catch hold of a child leaning over the banisters without thinking about it. Only later did I realize how very improperly my impulse had made me behave. I made haste to assure Drive B that we were all extremely glad to owe the pleasure of his acquaintance to this incident, and said that after all he had told me I would now be doubly interested to see him playing in tomorrow's improvised match. Drive B made an uneasy movement. No, you really mustn't expect too much. It will be only a kind of test for me a test to see if, if I'm even capable of playing a normal game of chess. A game on a real chessboard with actual chessmen and a living partner for I doubt more and more whether those hundreds, perhaps thousands of games I played were genuine games of chess and not just a kind of dream chess. Delirious chess, a game played in a fever, missing out certain stages as you do in a dream. I hope you don't really expect me to get anywhere against a chess champion, in fact the world champion. What interests and intrigues me is just a retrospective curiosity to find out whether I was really playing chess in my cell or whether it was mere delusion, if I was on the edge of the dangerous precipice at the time or already over it, that's all, nothing more. At that moment the gong summoning us to dinner was struck at the far end of the ship. We must have talked for almost two hours drive B had told his story to me at much greater length than I have set it down here. I thanked him with all my heart and took my leave. But I had not walked all the way along the deck before he followed me to Ed. Obviously nervous, even stammering slightly, and one more thing. In case I should appear uncivil later. Would you tell the gentleman in advance that I will play only one game, it's to be the final line drawn under an old account, a last goodbye, not a new beginning. I wouldn't want to fall into that frantic passion of chess playing a second time. I think of it now only with horror, and moreover, moreover, the doctor warned me too, expressly warned me. A man who has once fallen victim to a mania is always at risk, and in a case of chess poisoning, even if you're cured, it's better not to go near a chessboard. So y'all understand just this one game, as a test for myself, no more. We assembled in the smoking room next day punctually at the appointed hour, three o'clock. Our party had been increased by two enthusiasts for the royal game, ship's officers who specially asked for time off their duties so that they could watch the match. Chantavik did not keep us waiting as on the previous day either and after the usual draw for colors the remarkable match between this unknown man and the famous world champion began. I am sorry that it was played only for us amateur spectators, and any record of it is lost to the annals of the art of chess, just as Beethoven's piano improvisations are lost to music. On the following afternoons we did try to reconstruct the match from memory. But in vain, during the game itself we had probably all been paying too much rapt attention to the players rather than the course of play. For the intellectual contrast between their bearing became more and more obvious as the game went on. Chantovic, the experienced player, remained motionless as a block throughout, his eyes lowered to the chessboard with a stern, fixed gaze. In him, Thought seemed to be an actual physical effort requiring the utmost concentration of all his organs. Drive B, on the other hand, was relaxed and natural in his movements. As a true dilettante in the best sense of the word, 
one to whom, when he plays a game, it is the game itself that brings Delato joy. He was entirely relaxed, talked to us during the first few pauses, explaining points, lit himself a cigarette with a light hand, and when it was his turn just looked straight at the board for a minute. Every time he seemed to have been expecting his opponent's move in advance, the obligatory opening moves went by quite quickly. Only at the seventh or eighth did something like a definite plan appear to emerge. Chantovic spent longer thinking between moves, from which we sensed that the real battle for the upper hand was beginning. But to be perfectly honest, the gradual development of the situation was something of a disappointment to us laymen, as it is in every real tournament game. For the more the chessmen became interlocked in a strange, intricate formation, the more impenetrable did the real state of affairs seem to us. We couldn't tell what either of the opponents intended, or which of the two really held the advantage. We just noticed individual pieces being advanced like levers to break through the enemy front, but we were unable since with these first class players every movement was always combined several moves in advance to see the strategic intention in all this towing and throwing. And in addition a numbing weariness gradually set in, mainly because of Chantovic's endless pauses to think, which were visibly beginning to irritate our friend too. I noticed uneasily that as the game went on he began shifting more and more restlessly in his chair, now nervously lighting cigarette after cigarette, now reaching for his pencil to note something down. Then again he ordered mineral water and hastily drank glass after glass, it was clear that he could combine a hundred times faster than Chantovic. Every time the latter, after endless deliberations, decided to move a piece forward with his ponderous hand, our friend just smiled like someone who sees something long expected happen, and he quickly riposted. With his rapidly working mind, he must have worked out all the possibilities open to his opponent in advance. The longer Chantovic's decision was delayed, therefore, the more impatient he became, and as he waited a displeased, almost hostile look hovered around his lips. But Chantovic was not to be hurried. He thought hard and silently, and paused for longer and longer intervals the fewer pieces were left on the board. At the forty-second move, after they had been playing for two and three-quarter hours, we were all sitting warily and almost indifferently around the tournament table. One of the ship's officers had already gone off, the other had picked up a book to read, and looked up for a minute only whenever there was a change on the board. But then suddenly, at a move of Chantovic's, the unexpected happened. As soon as Drive B saw that Chantovic was taking hold of the knight to move it forward, he crouched like a cat about to pounce. His whole body began to tremble, and no sooner had Chantovic made his move with the knight than he quickly moved his queen and said, in a loud and triumphant voice, there, done it, leaned back, crossed his arms over his chest, and looked challengingly at Chantovic. A fiery light suddenly glowed in his pupils. We involuntarily bent over the board, trying to understand the moves so triumphantly announced. At first sight there was no obvious direct threat. Our friend's remark must therefore refer to some development that we amateurs, with our limited powers of thought, could not work out yet. Chantovic was the only one among us who had not moved at the challenging statement. He sat there as imperturbably as if he had entirely failed to hear that offensive done it. Nothing happened. As we were all instinctively holding our breath, you could suddenly hear the ticking of the clock which had been put on the table for timing the moves. Three minutes passed, seven minutes, eight minutes Chantovic did not stir, but I felt as if his thick nostrils were even further dilated by some inner exertion. Our friend seemed to find this silent waiting as intolerable as we did. Suddenly he rose to his feet and began pacing up and down the smoking room, first slowly, then faster and faster. Everyone looked at him in some surprise, but no one with more uneasiness than I did, for it struck me that for all the vigor of his tread, his steps always measured out exactly the same amount of space. It was as if he kept coming up against an invisible cupboard in the middle of the empty floor, and it obliged him to turn. With a shudder, I realized that this pacing back and forth unconsciously reproduced the dimensions of his former cell. 
In the months of captivity, he must have marched up and down like a caged animal in exactly the same way. He must have clasped his hands and hunched his shoulders exactly like that. He must have gone up and down that cell in precisely this manner a thousand times, with the glint of madness in his fixed yet feverish gaze. However, his powers of thought still seemed entirely intact, for from time to time he impatiently turned to the table to see if Chantovic had made up his mind yet. But the wait drew out to nine and then ten minutes. Then, at last, something none of us had expected happened. Slowly, Chantovic raised his heavy hand, which until now had been lying motionless on the table. We all waited in suspense for his decision, but Chantovic did not make a move. Instead, he slowly but with a determined gesture pushed all the pieces off the board with the back of his hand. Not until the next moment did we understand. Chantovic had resigned the game. He had capitulated so as to avoid being visibly checkmated in front of us. The improbable had happened. The world champion, the grandmaster who had won countless tournaments, had lowered his colors to an unknown, a man who hadn't touched a chessboard for 20 or 25 years. Our anonymous and obscure friend had beaten the greatest chess player on earth in open battle. Without noticing it, we had risen to our feet one by one. We all felt we had to say or do something to express our delighted amazement. The one man who kept still and unmoved was Chantovic. Only after a measured pause did he raise his head and look stonily at our friend. Another game, he asked. Of course, replied Drive B, with an enthusiasm that I did not like. And before I could remind him of his resolve to play only a single game, he sat down and began setting up the chessmen again with feverish haste. He assembled them so rapidly that a pawn twice slipped through his shaking fingers and fell to the floor. The painful discomfort I had already felt at his unnatural excitement grew to a kind of fear. For an obvious mood of elation had come over the previously calm and quiet man. The tick played around his mouth more and more often, and his body trembled as if shaken by a sudden fever. No, I whispered quietly to him. Not now. Let that be enough for today. It's too much of a strain on you. A strain? Ha! Huh. He laughed out loud, not pleasantly. I could have played seventeen games in that time, instead of dawdling along. The only strain I feel is in not going to sleep playing at this pace. There, you begin. He had spoken these last words to Chantovic in a vigorous, almost rough tone. Chantovic looked at him, a calm and measured look, but his fixed, stony gaze had something of a clenched fist about it now. Suddenly there was something new between the two players, a dangerous tension, a passionate hatred. They were no longer two partners wanting to try out their skill on each other in play, but enemies mutually sworn to destroy one another. Chantovic hesitated for a long time before making the first move, and I had a clear feeling that he was waiting so long on purpose. Trained tactician that he was, he had obviously found out that his slow tempo itself wearied and irritated his opponent. So it took him no less than four minutes to make the simplest, most normal of all openings by moving his king's pawn the usual to squares forward. Immediately our friend countered with his own king's pawn, but once again Chantovic paused for an endless, almost intolerable time. It was like a bright lightning strike when you wait, heart thudding, for the thunder, but the thunder doesn't roll and still doesn't roll. Chantovic did not move. He thought quietly, slowly, and I became even more certain that he was thinking slowly with malice of forethought. However, that gave me plenty of time to observe Drive B. He had just drunk his third glass of water, involuntarily. I remembered how he had told me about his raging thirst in his cell. All the signs of abnormal excitement were clearly present. I saw perspiration stand out on his brow, while the scar on his hand was redder and stood out more sharply than before. But he was still in control of himself. Only when Chantovic yet again thought endlessly about the fourth move did his composure give way, and he suddenly snapped at him. Come along, make your move, can't you? Chantovic looked up coolly. As far as I'm aware, we agreed on ten minutes between moves. I don't play with any shorter time span, on principle. Drive B. Bit his lip, I saw the sole of his shoe rocking restlessly, 
more and more restlessly up and down on the floor under the table, and I myself was made progressively more nervous by the ominous foreboding that something beyond reason was brewing in his mind. In fact, there was a second incident at the eighth move. Drive B, who had been waiting with less and less composure, could no longer restrain his tension. He moved back and forth and began unconsciously drumming his fingers on the table. Once again, Chantavik raised his heavy, rustic head. May I ask you not to drum your fingers like that? It disturbs me. I can't play in this way. Ha! Huh. Barked Drive B, laughing. So we see. Chantavik's forehead reddened. What do you mean by that? He asked sharply and unpleasantly. Drive B, laughed briefly again, maliciously. Nothing. Only that you are obviously very nervous. Chantavik said nothing, but looked down. Not until seven minutes later did he make the next move, and the game dragged on at this deadly pace. You felt as if Chantavik were turning to stone. In the end he paused each time to think for the maximum period agreed before making up his mind on a move, and from one interval to the next our friend's behavior became ever more bizarre. It looked as if he had lost interest in the game and was thinking about something else entirely. He stopped pacing rapidly up and down and sat motionless in his place, staring into space with a fixed, almost mad look. He kept muttering incomprehensible remarks to himself. Either he had lost himself in endless combinations or else and this was my own suspicion he was working out completely different games. For every time Chantavik finally made his move he had to be reminded to come back to the here and now. Then it took him several minutes to find his way around the situation again, and I began to suspect ever more strongly that he had really forgotten Chantavik and all of us long ago in a cold form of derangement that might suddenly vent itself in violence. And sure enough, at the nineteenth move the crisis came. Chantavik had hardly moved his piece before Drive B. Suddenly, and without looking properly at the board, pushed his bishop three squares forward, crying so loud that we all jumped. Check. Your king's in check. We immediately looked at the board, expecting to see some exceptional move. But after a minute something that none of us expected happened. Chantavik raised his head very, very slowly, and looked as he had never done before from one to another of us as we sat there. He seemed to be enjoying something hugely, for gradually a satisfied and clearly derisive smile began to appear on his lips. Only after he had enjoyed this triumph of his to the full we still didn't understand it did he turn with mock civility to address our party. I'm sorry, but I see no check. Do any of you gentlemen think that my king is in check? We looked at the board, and then we looked in concern at Drive B. The square where Chantavik's king stood was indeed, as any child could see, shielded from the bishop by a pawn, so no check to the king was possible. We became uneasy. Could our friend, in his haste, have moved a piece the wrong way, one square too far or too near? Now Drive B, himself, alerted by our silence, was staring at the board, and began stammering heatedly, but the king should be on F7 it's in the wrong place, quite the wrong place. You made the wrong move. Everything's wrong on this board, the pawn should be on g5, not g, for this is a completely different game. This is he suddenly stopped. I had taken him firmly by the arm, or rather pinched his arm so hard that even in his feverish confusion he was bound to feel my grip. He turned and stared at me like a sleepwalker. What, what do you want? All I said was, remember, at the same time running my finger over the scar on his hand. Instinctively, he followed my movement, and his glazed eyes stared at the blood-red line of it. Then he suddenly began to tremble, and a shudder ran through his whole body. For God's sake, he whispered, his lips pale. Have I said or done something absurd? Can I after all have gone? No, I whispered quietly. But you must break this game off at once. It's high time. Remember what the doctor told you. Drive B. Rose abruptly. I do apologize for my stupid mistake he said, in his old, courteous voice, and he bowed to Chantovic. Of course, what I said was pure nonsense. Naturally, the game is yours. Then he turned to us. I must apologize to you gentlemen too, but I did warn you in advance not expect too much of me. Forgive the awkwardness of it, this is the last time I ever try to play a game of chess. 
he bowed and walked off in the same inconspicuous, mysterious way as he had first appeared. Only I knew why the man would never touch a chessboard again while the others were left, slightly confused with the uncertain feeling of having only just avoided something uncomfortable and dangerous. Damned fool, growled the disappointed McConnor. Last of all, Chantovic rose from his chair and cast another glance at the half-finished game. A pity, he said magnanimously. It wasn't a bad attack at all. For an amateur, that gentleman really is uncommonly gifted. The end. Thank you for listening.